tragedy. It's a very sad day where we have failed our children. I think the children have and have gone through so much trauma and this is actually further trauma, secondary victimization, violating their rights even further. Not only the child victims, their families, but I think society in general where children have been failed by the very systems that should have protected them. I want to let on to those very words you use that we failed our children. Do you feel partly responsible now that Judge Johnson mentions you saying that you contaminated the investigation of this matter? So I think we need to understand, appreciate and recognize that we followed due processes, diligent processes where forensic assessments were conducted and under those conditions there's no opportunity for contamination or coaching. This is to ascertain the veracity and credibility of child witnesses where open-ended questions are asked who, what, where, when. The quest for details is imperative so it is very clear that there was no coaching or contamination. A report is compiled, reliability and consistency is also tested through the use of various methods and techniques by qualified and skilled competent professionals. With regards to the court preparation program, court preparation is not coaching the child what to say, but to say it as it happened. It's allaying fears and anxieties around the court processes, role playing with the child, what to anticipate, etc. And if the child doesn't understand questions or cannot remember, to, uh, to reassure the child to say that it's okay. So we followed protocols, we complied, adhered to what was expected of us. Children, it is actually very normal if one is in clinical practice for children's evidence to be inconsistent or to find discrepancies. And I think that is where the challenge comes forward, that the judge should have actually followed through on that. Because the judge, one needs to appreciate, is not a trained therapist, he's not a mental health professional, and would not understand how to communicate with children or childhood trauma or to also recognize that there would be inconsistencies and that there's dissociation and repression of memory in victims of trauma. One needs to look at anxiety levels, one needs to look at depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, which was not factored into. Let's talk nitty-gritties here, Dr. Omar. What role exactly did you play as the teddy bear clinic in as far as this case is concerned? And were there areas, now that the judge has pronounced in this fashion, were there areas where you feel, yes, indeed, you may have overstepped your bounds? So we worked with three of the victims. Remember, there were 11 children in this proceeding. We worked with three of the children. So what role did we play? Our role was to evaluate, as I mentioned, and our role was to enable the children to testify in court, not coaching because the court prep counselor does not have any knowledge and does not go into the content or the merits of the case. So that was our role and our responsibility. In terms of the other children, there were other stakeholders that were involved. And it is clearly evident that the judge should have relied on independent expert witnesses to come in and explain a lot of the challenges that were being played out in court, which there wasn't any uh, uh, opportunity to do because when the NPA approached the judge, it was not allowed, it was not permitted. In terms of bringing in an expert witness, that was not allowed. But even earlier on, the judge had already prejudged the way reference was made to coaching and when the NPA, the advocate asked the judge to recuse himself on those grounds because it appeared that the judge may have been biased, that was also dismissed. So is that your contention, that the judge in this case actually did not conduct himself in a professional manner? Well, I would not say in a professional may way. I just think that the judge 
should have relied on independent witnesses, relied on the use of an assessor to support him, guide him, direct him, because by no means he's a, he's a presiding officer. He does not have knowledge, expert and information around childhood trauma and childhood sexual abuse and the impact and the effects and, and how it could affect children's testimony. How, how did he prejudge this situation in your view? Because you, you keep using this word that well, judge. Well, so uh, the judge alluded to the fact of coaching and questions that were, or the responses that were elicited by the children. I think it is important to understand that our satellite office at, in Soweto, we share the same formal setting like the prosecutors who were involved in this case. And the, when the children were questioned, they made reference to the place when they were asked, so where did you, you know, where did you say this? And the children responded to the teddy bear clinic. Meanwhile, they had spoken to prosecutors at the teddy bear clinic and other professionals. And, and I think there was no opportunity for clarification. And, and this is where I think uh, things were not contextualized or understood clearly. Dr. Omar, when all is said and done, mm. ultimately, Mr. Mulefe is now acquitted. Um, there is hope by some that this case may be revived. But when all is said and done, with the judge having made mention of the comedy of errors that played themselves out in this case, who, in your view, bungled this case? I think uh, the, the challenge that we've continuously experienced over the years where children have been compromised, where investigations have not been thoroughly uh, or rigorously done, I think challenges have been with the educational institutions in the past where people have not been trained on the ground or equipped or enabled and empowered to address uh, disclosures, how to report it, how to manage it and in terms of uh, processes to be followed, that has been a challenge. And I know that these are the lessons that we have learned over the past year. Do you hope that this case will be revived? Are you involved in efforts to try and revive it? Absolutely. We're going to fight, we fight it tooth and nail because I think it is important to understand why would 87 young children between the ages of 5 and 13 make false allegations and provide graphic details about traumatic experiences and give age-appropriate sexual knowledge, where would they get that information from? What would their motivation be to confabulate or make up stories like that? Did the school management, and in particular, the principal play any role in allegedly shielding this individual? Well, I think it was not managed appropriately. Uh, it was the children's disclosures were not received appropriately. When they made initial disclosures, uh, it was not received and reports were not made immediately.